actually in week four of this series called Peace of Work, where we're, we're watching a guy named Peter grow up in his faith. A guy, he's the Apostle Peter, if you've heard of him, and, and he was a premier piece of work. However, however, Peter possessed these, or, or developed these five traits that each one of us needs to develop if we're going to reach our full potential, our, our God-given potential. And so we've been watching Peter kind of make his mistakes and growing with Peter as, as he develops. And so this week, we're going we're gonna to kind of pick up where we left off. So just, just, just to kind of summarize, summarize, Jesus initiated his relationship with Peter by calling him a name. That's how it all started. Peter uh, met Jesus, and the first thing Jesus said to Peter was, you're Simon which means to hear, and you will become, or you, you, you're going to be Peter, which means rock. That's going to factor in later. So, so Peter's like, oh, that's interesting. And Jesus knew exactly what he's doing, because Peter, this is the first trait, had this insatiable curiosity that Jesus knew would eventually lead him to come follow him. And, and so eventually, the second trait developed in his life. Peter wasn't born with it, but he developed it. And it was this trait of, of this all-in attitude. Peter, Peter actually, we, we learned this, he was a fisherman, and he actually went back fishing like three times, back and forth, back and forth, because he was having such a hard time committing to Jesus. So some of us probably can relate to that as well. Uh, the third one was a teachable heart. We talked about that last week, that for all of Peter's faults, he had this amazing capacity to let Jesus correct him over and over and over and over again. And because of that, he actually grew into the kind of guy that, that, that you know, we know today and that, that Jesus was able to build on this, this kingdom that he was establishing. Today we're going to talk about Peter's bias towards action. And, and this is a huge, huge deal. And, and there's no, no better story to illustrate what I'm talking about. And, and as we look at our own lives and, and, and developing this own trait in our own lives, then the story, maybe you've heard of it. If you haven't, we're going to go through it, where Peter gets to walk on water. He gets out of a boat to walk on water. So I just gave away the punchline, for, but, but it's only fair because if you read the story before, you know the punchline. If you haven't heard the story before, there. Now we're on par with everybody. Everybody's in the same, same footing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the story, but here's the deal. I want you to put yourself in the boat with the other disciples. The only rule is you're not Peter, okay? Peter gets to be Peter, but just pretend you're in the boat. I know there's not room for everybody, so just pretend no one else came. It's just you, okay? Just you with, with those 12 disciples in the boat, okay? So as I'm reading, put yourself in the story. Just feel the waves, the, the up and down. Feel the wind. Feel the disciples straining at the oars as they're trying to make progress against the wind. Picture the darkened sky and how it unfolds. You're there. You need to be in that boat to get the most out of this message. Okay? So, if you're not an imaginative person, can't help you. Okay, so. <laughs> become more imaginative now. There. Okay, so here's, here's how the story goes. Jesus had just, by the way, fed 5,000 people at least with a little kid's lunch. He had just multiplied it to feed this multitude of people. And, and once the crowd cleared, Jesus dismissed the crowd. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side of this big lake while he dismissed the crowd. Now, if you're one of the 12, you're thinking, you're there with them going, how's Jesus going to get there, right? This is what you'd be thinking. We're, how, we just left them. We just ditched them on the beach. I don't understand. So, while he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Another translation, or another version of the story, it appears several times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Another version says that because the wind was so strong, the disciples were struggling at the oars, and they weren't really making much progress at all. I don't know if you've ever been in a canoe, where you're paddling against the wind, and you're not making any progress. Now, I don't know how many of them there would have been uh, rowing. There were 12 of them in the boat. Let's just assume there's at least three paddles on each side. So there's six or eight guys rowing and rowing, and they're struggling against the wind. And you're there. You're watching all this happen. Maybe you're one of the ones rowing 
rowing, rowing, not making any progress. Are we ever going to get there? Okay, shortly before dawn, okay, so the sun hasn't come up yet, but you know that where the light starts to grow, you start to see what's going on, or on the lake, the waves are becoming more visible. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It's I. It's me. It is I. (laughs) Don't be afraid. Okay, so you're among the twelve. Jesus is walking on the waves, freaking you right out. He says, don't be afraid. Peter's in the boat. What does Peter do? This guy with the insatiable curiosity, the guy who's learning to go all in with Jesus, the guy who's, who's willing to be corrected and make mistakes. What is Peter going to do? What none of us in this room would have done. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And the rest of y'all are going, what? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. For one thing, what if it's Satan? Satan would be like, come. <laughs> right? Peter's like, just, just push, into the water. Like, how is this a good question? But Jesus says, Come. And your eye rolling turns to eye popping as Peter gets up, puts his, ro- his, his oar down, and starts stepping out of the boat. Peter got down out of the boat while you're watching, and he walked on, I feel like there should be a word like flipping here or something, water. He walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Let me pause there for a minute. There's there's two places in the New Testament where this word for doubt is used. and, And it's translated doubt here. But the accurate translation is hesitate. Why did you hesitate? You were killing it. You were walking on water, right? So this is, this is awesome. So why did you hesitate? And when they climbed into the boat, he and Jesus, the wind died down, and the window of opportunity closes. Sitting there in the boat, you have a realization. Now, you, you've, you've decided to follow Jesus. You've You've made the commitment. You've walked with him now for a couple of years. You've watched him open blind eyes, and you've watched the lame walk, and you've you've watched all kinds of incredible things happen. But one thing becomes abundantly clear in this moment. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who live great stories and those who dream about them. Those who live the great stories and those who retell other people's great stories. Those who live great stories and those who wish they had stories to tell. There's something else that that occurs to you in this moment. It should anyways, and I just want to point it out if it hasn't occurred to you. And that is this. Peter was looking for a way in not a way out. Even though this incredible thing was happening around them, one in 12, I bet you it would have been one in 100. It could have been one in 1,000 people. Who in their right mind would be in the middle of this storm, rowing like crazy, not making headway? In fact, so little headway that Jesus is walking and passing them. And in this moment, see Jesus on the wind wind and the waves going, I bet you I could do that if I just asked Like, who in the right mind? He is looking for a way to go deeper into the moment. And this is another way you could parse this out. Two kinds of people. The the person who lives great stories is looking for a way to go deeper. The person who wishes they were living great stories is looking for an excuse. Looking for an out. 
Now, here's my question for you. There in the boat, Jesus and Peter get in the boat. The wind dies down. And the, the window of opportunity is closed. Peter got to do what no one else has ever gotten to do in the history of the world. And you were sitting there watching. Would you rather be more like Peter or would you rather stay in the boat? Come on, there's got to be part of you that wants to be more like Peter. <laughs> there's got to be part of you that, that, that identifies with that, ah, I'm always on the outside looking in and I wish, I wish, I wish I was more like Peter. I wish I was looking for a way in and I wish I just wouldn't live with these stupid excuses and these fears and I wish, I wish I would have been that. Why couldn't that have been me? I bet you. So why don't we go there today? Let's learn from Peter. Let, this is an incredible story where we get to learn how Peter works and how God works and how all of that comes together. So let me break the story down a little bit. And this isn't the only way to see it, okay? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use some analogies here, some metaphors. I'm not saying that every time you see a boat in the scriptures, it means this. Or every time you see a lake, it means that. That's not what I mean. But in this story, I think we can make a good case for what I'm about to say here today. I believe that the boat in the story represents the box of excuses that we ride through daily life. I really believe that. Now, now you could make a case, you're going, that's not an excuse. Like, Peter was just dumb. He just asked the stupid question, and Jesus took him up on it. So the other 12 and that, or the 11 there, 12 if it's you, the, the other 12, they're, they're not making excuses yet. But see, here's the thing. The moment Jesus said, yep, come, and they watch Peter get up out of the boat and start walking, what's keeping them there in the boat instead of saying, How, can, can I come? That's an excuse. Do you see that? From there on in, they're going, ah, oh, and they're going, well, maybe, maybe it's only for Peter. Maybe that's the, the thing. I bet you, you know, Jesus always is playing favorites. It's, it's, Peter always gets to do the cool stuff. Maybe that's your excuse. Now, now let's, let's just unpack what is an excuse before I get too, too deep into this. What's an excuse? Why are excuses so dangerous? I, I said, I, I posted something on social media this week that, that an excuse may get you off the hook, but it lands you on the bench. And in a very, very clear way, the other guys in the boat are on the bench and Peter's in the game doing the stuff. See, Peter didn't just think cool stuff about Jesus. He didn't just say cool stuff about Jesus. He actually took Jesus at his word, and he did cool stuff with Jesus. And that's where the action is. So what's an excuse? Let's put it this way. An excuse is an imaginary limitation that you place on yourself. Imaginary. I use that word on purpose because I thought it would poke you. I thought it would be like, it's not imaginary. Well, let, let me just make a distinction here. There are reasons and there are excuses. A reason would be a legitimate, a real limitation. An excuse is an imaginary one. Like your friends invite you to go out and you're like, oh, I'm busy, but you're not really busy. You're tired or you're whatever, but you're placing an imaginary limitation between you and something. And here's the crazy part. I didn't finish the sentence. An excuse is an imaginary limitation that keeps us from real experiences. That's scary. So I erect this invisible wall between me and, and what God is calling me to do. That, that's just pretend. That's keeping me from my fear or whatever, but it, or keeping me in my fear. But it's keeping me from actually walking on water or watching God do things that only the people who take him seriously and, and take him at his word can experience. You can watch that happen to other people, like the disciple, other disciples in the boat. But if you want to experience that... We have to do something about these excuses. Now, in that boat with you, there are 11 guys. And maybe one of those guys says, this is a really good one. His excuse for not joining Peter on the water is, people can't walk on water. That's his excuse. That's impossible. That doesn't make sense. 
or maybe it's safer here in the boat in a storm, hello, than jumping overboard. So don't miss this. That's not faulty logic. That's sound logic. Sound logic, in this case, is an excuse, and it becomes an imaginary excuse that's keeping them from real experiences with Jesus. How many of you know that an excuse or, or logic can never take you over the side of a boat to walk on water? In fact, you could say excuses in general don't get to walk on water. So, so sure, hold on to your excuses, but every one of those excuses are keeping you from holding on to something of Jesus that you can't get any other way than letting it go and holding on to what he has for you. You see, logic, if you, if you know some, some Bible stories, if you don't, that's what I'm going to kind of fire off. Logic never walks you around a city seven times a day for seven days and then shout and watch the wall fall down. Logic can't take you there. Logic can't help you understand how a virgin can be with child. Logic can't multiply a kid's lunch and feed a multitude. Logic can't raise the dead. The soundest logic in the world cannot get you there. So if you are waiting to understand, waiting for something to make sense, you are getting left behind. I'm not saying that faith has no logic underpinnings and that there is, there's no real historical evidence for the resurrection. Of course there is. Of course God wants to engage our mind. But if God can fit in this brain of mine, he's not very big. That's what I'm saying. So whatever the excuse is, maybe, maybe the excuse is, well, nobody else is doing it. Peter's an outlier, right? Like, Peter's the whack job of the, of the group. Of course, Peter would try that, but I'm, that's, not my, that's not my gift. I'm not a water walker. Um, I don't have training in water walking. I don't have time for this. We're rowing. Can you not see that we're trying to get somewhere? Jesus is probably going, well, how's that working for you? I'm passing you by walking. But no matter what the excuse is, it's keeping you from a real experience with the God of the universe that you can't get any other way than just taking him at his word and looking for a way in, all right? So that's the boat. The boat represents these excuses that we all hold on to. And in fact, we ride them. We're like, you know, I would help but my schedule and my, you know, like I just, we're just like, we, yeah, we're, we're a little tight right now financially and we all we'll have our excuses that carry us through things. And there are go-to answers when, everyone, when anyone asks and there are go-to answers when Jesus asks. Ugh. So let's talk about the lake. What is this lake these waves, this, this struggle represents. Well, or what does a lake represent? Lake represents the struggle that Jesus is using to coax us out of our excuses. Again, here's Jesus walking, passing them on the lake, going, hey, you may want to try something different, right? And now, I, don't, I really don't know what kind of person it takes to go, I could do that. I, I really, I really, that still is mind-boggling to me. So just, just think of it this way. Here's, here's even in a group of people that have already given up everything to follow Jesus, only one in 12 of those people got to experience this. Again, how do you become that guy? How do we, how do we become that kind of person, that kind of woman that, that, that just thinks of things that God can do that are so far outside the box that nobody else is thinking even to even pray about it? This is the kind of guy that Peter is. And Jesus is using this struggle to coax them out of the boat, to let go of their excuses. See, because when Jesus walks by, there's not an excuse in the world that holds water. None of them do. If you want in on the action, you've got to get out of the boat. You've got to step out of your excuses. I want you to be thinking about this right now. I, like, obviously Jesus isn't actually telling you to get out of an actual boat, but what is Jesus challenging you to do? What do you know deep down in your gut is the next step for you? Is it giving your life to Jesus for the first time? Is it, is it trusting Jesus with your finances? Is it, is it 
inviting that coworker over and starting a friendship with someone? Is it sharing your faith? Is it praying for someone who's sick? Is it what, what is speaking up for Jesus in a situation that's really dark? Is it loving someone that doesn't, isn't really easy to love? Is it forgiving someone that doesn't deserve forgiveness? What is Jesus coaxing you to do? And what are the excuses that mount up inside of you? What is your yeah, but... that you're actually holding up to Jesus as some kind of trump card that would get you off the hook for the Son of God asking you to do something. That's what this is about. If you want in on the action, you have to step out of your excuses. Somehow Peter knows something that we often forget. He seems to intuitively know that there, there's some aspects of God's character that you cannot get just reading the Bible. He seems to understand that, I'm not saying that reading the Bible's bad, you, you understand? But there's, there's only so much of God you can encounter in there. There's some things that, that you could pray about all day long and you will not see that part of God until you step out in faith and do what he's asking you to do. There are things that you can only get while you're doing something you shouldn't be able to do. He seems to understand that. Now, now let just remember, what was Peter's name? Jesus gave him a name. Peter, what does that mean? Rock. What's happening in this story? The rock is being asked to do what? Step out on water. So this whole time, Jesus is like, you're the rock, you're the rock, you're the rock, you're the rock. Rocks sink. So here, Peter somehow understands that in order to become the rock, he has to risk sinking like one. This is awesome. Now, Knowing what the lake is, the lake and the storm, is, is Jesus' invitation. He's trying to pull you up out of your excuses to become everything he knows that you can be because he made you. This is what the lake represents. But you're in the boat, and you've got no time, and you've got no money, and you've got your excuses, and it's not my gift, and it's not my thing, and it's da-da-da. you've got all these excuses, and this battle is going on, this battle is going on. Once you see this, and once you realize that to become more like Peter, you have to leave those excuses behind, you know what happens? You start hating the boat. You start loathing that excuse and the power it seems to have over you. And I, I just pray that for you, that, that something inside of you starts, that, that, that excuse, what's your go-to? What's your go-to? You have probably three you use all the time. You, you know them. They're like cards in your hand and you play that card. Boom, I'm off the hook. That's the one. When you start, you have this you know, this twisted pride when you play that card. But now, God, because I'm actually doing this, I'm wrecking it for you. So now, now you're going you're gonna to start playing that card and go, Whoa, and you realize, I hate this card. I don't want to spend my whole life in this stupid boat that technically gets me from A to B, but not very well when I could be walking somewhere that I don't have the power to walk. I could be experiencing things about God that I've never seen before. I could, it's like the final frontier. You're stepping out, you know, and it's beautiful. So what do you do? What do you do? What's, what's the, the first step isn't actually getting out of the boat. You know that? The, the first step is fixing your eyes on Jesus. I, I, I think part of what happened is the, the other guys in the boat, and including you and me, we're busy looking at the storm and we're busy looking at the waves, and yep, there's Jesus, and I hope he comes over here because that will be better for us. And, and, and Peter, though, I, I picture Peter like transfixed on this figure, navigating these waves going, wow. You, know, you have those moments where everything just goes quiet, and you get like tunnel vision, and you're like, that is awesome. 
I think, I think Peter became so enraptured with Jesus, and he understood something powerful. And I'm going to share this with you. It's going to maybe take a second to digest, but I literally, I spent an hour and a half on this. So, so if it's not any good, just lie to me, okay? But this is, this is, the, this is the bottom line of this message, because here, here it is. If, if you're here this morning thinking this is just another pep talk, you need to jump out of the boat or like you need to try harder, do something you've never done, carpe diem and all. If that's what you're hearing, you're not hearing me. Here's the bottom line. Faith in a limitless Christ unleashes a sacred audacity that expands our capacity. That's what this is about. Peter is so enraptured with the limitless power of the Son of God that he realizes Jesus' presence here changes everything, including what I'm capable of. Not because I have it within myself, but because I'm close to him. And the closer I get to him, the better it gets. So I'm with him. I'm out of the boat. Because the closer I get to Jesus, the more I hang on to Jesus, and the more I'm enraptured with Jesus and worship Jesus, the more he transforms me, I become more like him. And if he wants me to walk on water, I guess I'll walk on water. And if I'm the rock and that was my destiny to sink to the bottom, I guess at the bottom I'll learn to praise him there somehow. He's got, like Tom, we were saying yesterday, I guess he's got something to show me at the bottom of the lake. Whatever it is, but I'm going towards Jesus. The reason I call it audacity, again, is who in their right mind looks at that situation and goes, the solution (laughs) is is walking on water, I'm pretty sure. Now notice this has nothing to do, as you're watching Peter do this, you're in the boat watching him do this, this has nothing to do with what Peter has or doesn't have. It doesn't have anything to do with with who he is or who he isn't what he's capable of or incapable of. It has everything to do with the object of Peter's faith who is capable of anything. And the presence of Jesus, and as we recognize the presence of Jesus, it transforms and elevates every situation so that possibilities emerge that did not exist a moment before we put our eyes on him. Oh, that's good. That's really good. That's good news. That's good news. It means that my excuses, that's not my gift, that's, not, that, that's my limit, I don't have that much strength, I don't have that much money, I don't have, all of those are moot. And, and my logic might be actually keeping me in the boat. Here, here's one for you. This one might sting a little. I, I hear people say, um, I, I, would be, I would be more generous with my money or I'd be giving you know, to, the, to the work if I had more money. We don't have enough money, so we can't give. Has it ever occurred to you the reason you don't have enough money is because you aren't giving enough away? That's the kind, that logic can't get you there, I realize. The more you give away, the more you have. Okay, now here, how, how many, let me try, try this. Some of you are going, that, that makes no sense. How many of you have experienced this personally in this room? Yep. <laughs> how does that work? That's God. That's what we're talking about. That's walking on water. So good. Now, we fixed our eyes on Jesus. (laughs) Now what? Well, some of you already know. Some of you already know. You know the thing that God is calling you to do. It's to step up and have that conversation or forgive that person or it's to start, start giving or it's to start serving. It's to, to take a risk with your faith. It's to pray for someone who's sick. Whatever it is, you already have that, that feeling. And I know Peter had that feeling. So, so the other guys are rowing and they stop rowing maybe because Jesus is there and they're all freaking out and is that you? It's a ghost and, and all of this. And Peter's white knuckling the, the edge of the boat. I can just picture it. And in his heart, heart of hearts. This moment comes where he knows what he's supposed to ask for, and he goes, crap. You know that moment. You know exactly what God is asking you to do, but you're like, you don't want to do it because the excuses and the safety of the boat is so tempting in that moment, but you know, you know, you know, and Peter's like, okay, and he, he, he flies it out there knowing the other 11 are, and you and I are going to be rolling our eyes at him again. And he says, hey, if that's you, just ask me to come and I'll come. Come. 
All righty then, and off he goes. So there's this moment where an idea will come to you. And it might be a crazy idea. It might be an idea to do something that you've never done before. It might be something that you find incredibly difficult to do. Something you do not want to march back into. Whatever it is. And you have this, ah, oh, moment. So how do you know that's not just pizza talking? And how do you know that, that it's just, it's real. It's a real God idea. Well, you, it, this is so cool. It's so simple. You go, is that you, Lord? Super complicated, I know. <laughs> Peter's like, okay, I've got this like, idea. I just want to bounce off of you right now. <laughs> so like, I'm thinking of coming to you on the water, but I just really need to know, is that you? Yep, all right then. Right, so then, so literally just check with him. Again, some of, some of us come to church all our lives and we go through these moments like this, and you're like, how can that possibly work? Because he's real. <laughs> he likes talking to us, and he wants you out of the boat. So when you say, hey, I'm thinking of stepping out of the boat, what do you think? If it's him, he's going to tell you, okay? He, I don't know how Peter was convinced, but he was convinced. Yep, that was something in his mind went, yep, that's it. I'm, go I'm doing it, right? So then you have to get out of the boat. Now, in our life group, I got shamed in a, in a good way. Um, I'm going to turn it around and flip it back on them. But so I was like, I, I posed this, I think, this deep theological question. I go, can you imagine what that first step felt like? And someone pointed out it's that the first step isn't a problem because you still have one foot in the boat. Now you're straddling it. I'm like, okay, so technically it's the second step, right? So second step. So, so I just want to pull one more on you. It's the third step because that's the one where you actually let go of the boat, so, so have you ever felt, felt this, this thing that God's prompting you to do something, but you kind of do it with training wheels? You just, you, you don't totally obey, you just kind of do it. You don't totally do it, you kind of do it, and you have one foot left in the boat just in case it doesn't work. But the promise isn't that it's going to work. The promise is that you're going to become who he's called you to be by doing it. That's the promise. So if you sink, you sink, but, you're, but he's calling you out, out of the boat. So, so take the full two steps and then let go of the excuse and keep your eyes fixed on him. And again, don't expect to have it figured out before you do it. I guarantee this still didn't make sense as he let go. In fact, as Peter started looking around going, this doesn't make sense, that's when he sank, right? When he started analyzing going, that's not humanly possible. Ha, huh, what am I doing? Th th yeah, right, because you're, you're walking on water and that shouldn't work, but with Jesus it can because he can do the impossible. So don't overthink it, just do it, right? Well, what if I get it wrong? What if, what if I step out there and I, and I, I screw it up? You pull a Peter again. Again, this is not complicated. Lord, is that you? Yes, okay. So then you step out there. Oh, it's not working. What do you do? Lord, save me. And he's like, because he's right there, because he's so he's cheering you on, right? And he pulls you up and goes, that's, in a sense, he's going, that's my boy. Right on. <laughs> you sank, but you walked three steps. That's amazing. Oh. If, oh, what, what would this church look like full of people who had, were taking three steps, two steps on water? Whatever that water looks like for you, whatever the challenge is for you. Like, I, I, want, I want to see you become everything God calls you to be, but what would it be like to be in, full of, in a church that's full of people trying to get out of the boat, risking stuff, taking stuff, sinking, help, save me, whoops, I guess that wasn't God, but, we'll, but we're trying, right? Right? Okay. So, by the way, this morning, your first step out of the boat might be giving your life to Jesus for the very first time. There are actually a number of people here today who made that commitment right here in this kind of service. You know that? There are people in this room that got out of the boat, and the reason they're here today is because they got out of the boat. And right on the screen there, you've got the world's shortest prayer to God to become a believer. Lord, save me. Isn't that good? 
<laughs> Again, thank you, Peter, for just breaking it down for us, right? Lord, in other words, you're in charge. I am not. I'm, I'm putting myself at your mercy. Save me. Save, because I can't save myself. I am sinking. I cannot make this work. And, and please save me. Not just people in general, not just the world and world peace. And Me. I need you. Lord, save me. So if that's you today, I want to encourage you, a couple of us are going to be over to the side, and we want to help you pray that prayer and give your life to Jesus. Why would you stay in the boat? Why would you leave this, this moment, go, no, I'm just going to stay in the boat, when, when you know now what it can be like stepping out of the boat? That's my challenge to you. Why would you wait another second to pray this prayer and to give your life to Jesus? Okay, the second piece, though, you've done this before, you, you've given your life to Jesus, by now, probably, you're already thinking of something that you know God wants you to try. So now you ask him, is that you? And if you get the sense, yep, that's him, you take the first step, the second step, the third step, and then you don't, don't hesitate, like Peter, keep going. You know what one of the marks of a true disciple of Jesus is? The floor keeps rising. You know what I mean by that? The floor keeps rising. I'm doing things today that a year ago I could not do. I, I'm risking things today I never would have risked years ago. Peter's walking on water. Who gets to do that, right? So, so my capacity is increased not because I'm more spiritual, but because I've got my eyes fixed on a limitless Savior who and it just empowers me to do things I couldn't do. That's one of the marks of a true disciple. So, I, I know that I've, I, I've pushed some buttons here today. I want to leave that with Jesus now for you and him to work that out. Let me pray.